Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks, associate editor here at PC Gamer, and your host, as always, joining me today, back from Taipei, Mr. Wes Fenlin. Hello. Wes. I'm, I'm, my body is here. My mind is in 4 a.m. Taiwan time <laughs> right now. <laughs> so it's... It's four there or four forty three or four maybe three a.m. over there. I oh forget the exact time difference, um, but yeah, it's early morning. But it's okay. I'm I just had a big meatball sub, so that definitely won't put me to sleep <laughs> or anything. <laughs> we'll go easy on you. Also joining us uh, over the internet is Jared Walton. Jared, how you doing? Doing good. Just uh, kicking back, getting ready for a bunch of exciting hardware launches over the next month or two. Yeah, it's a busy time, man. Even not E3. E3 is all games next week, but it's just a busy it's a busy time for the PC in general. I feel like I say that, like, basically every month or so. I'm just like, it's such a busy time. <laughs> but it, but you're yeah. actually not lying this time. It's <laughs> yeah, true. Every other time it's I've been real. a bold-faced liar. <laughs> It's like every every January, every spring, every fall, like there's always hardware launches timed around those. Yeah. Well, we've got a great show for you guys today. We're going to be talking about those hardware things. Uh, we're, we're going to be diving into things like AMD's Threadripper and uh, just just a lot of good good hardware juicy stuff that I'm gonna I'm gonna let Jared tell us all about, and we're gonna we're gonna ask him about later. We're also gonna be talking about Wes's time in. Taipei for Computex, uh, which is exciting because that's a like it's it's a big show. It feels like, but it also feels like it all, sometimes kind of goes under the radar. Like it doesn't. Not a lot of people in 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 the Western world are super aware of it going on. Yeah, you know, it's big ish for PC uh, stuff, especially. It's not as big for mobile um, the way CES is, for example. Um, but I think we're just less aware of it because it's not in, you know, in the U.S. or in Europe um, because it's in Asia. And also because a lot of the big announcements like this year um, was kind of, you know, the Intel and AMD CPU stuff. It, they kind of they often will time them around Computex, but you don't have to know that it's related to Computex to mm -hmm. get you just see the info about Intel new CPUs or AMD new CPUs. You don't go, oh, you have to be at Computex to see this stuff. Yeah. Um, which is kind of the same whenever NVIDIA announces new graphics cards, whatever. So it's it's a pretty important show, but you don't necessarily need to be there on the show floor to get the biggest news out of it. Um, but you get to see weird stuff sometimes when you're there and cool CPU, uh, CP, PC case mods. Jesus, can't talk. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's there's fun stuff to, to find at Computex and I enjoy going every year. And we're also going to be talking about uh, E3, which is next week. For those, just to get this out of the way, we will not be having a show next week, but we will be having the PC gaming show, not PC gamer a show. Much bigger show. Much bigger thing. Day nine, uh, Sean Day Nine Plot hosting that on Monday, June twelfth at ten a.m. right here at Twitch.tv slash PC Gamer. You're not gonna want to miss that. It's gonna be just like I cannot overstate how how cool of a show it's gonna be. So so tune in and pretend that is me talking or something like. Why that. Why don't we have Day Nine host the PC Gamer show for us? You know, I'm gonna. Couldn't he just come do that every week? I'm gonna brush by the <laughs> hurtfulness of that statement and uh, and just say, yeah, that would be fun. How happy would you? You can be? cry later. Yeah, yeah. You would be thrilled to have Day Nine host, and you you not have to deal with hosting duties. Just <laughs> just chat with Day Nine. I would just be thrilled to chat with Day Nine every week in general. Like I could still be the host, and if he was here, I'd be a happier man. I love that, dude. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, we're also going to be talking about what we've been playing lately and take your questions from Twitch chat as usual. Uh, but first, let's start off with some recent news, some things that have been going on in the last few days, last week or so. Uh, there's there's a bunch of kind of mini topics, like this is going to sound contradictory, but like bigger, small topics that I wanted to hit kind of quick today. Um, one of which is Steam Greenlight is dead. It is officially dead and gone as of yesterday, which sucks for anybody who launched their green light campaign yesterday, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> to be fair, you kind of had some advance warning on yeah, that one. Yeah, they weren't they didn't say anything about the exact date they were going to do it, but but 
I mean, Valve has said this is going to happen for a long time. Yeah. So what? How long ago was it when they first did the? Oh God. Their, they announced their plan to replace Greenlight with a new system, Steam Direct. It was a few months ago that they first talked about this, and then was it last week when they posted the? Yeah, it was last week they posted their um, announcement of what the price was going to be for Steam Direct, which is a hundred dollars. And they said, you know, they were going to be launching it um, this this week, later this week. Uh, is next that right? Week. Next, next week. week. Yeah. So, yeah. If you if you launched a green light campaign within the past week, you have chosen poorly. <laughs> it's a bummer for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and that's kind of all there is to say, right? On on developers who did that. But at the same time, if you launched a green light campaign in the last week and you have a hundred dollars to spend on the fee, you no longer have to get approved on green light next week. You can just put your game on Steam. I saw, I saw a lot of interesting discussion around <clears throat> that green light, um, or sorry, the direct fee of $100. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw, like, one one journalist, uh, somebody tweeted something kind of flip that was like, uh, well, Steam had a good run or something like that, and I was kind of like, what the fuck? Uh, I don't know if that's the right attitude to to have about that that pricing. Um, but I don't know if it's a good price, honestly. Could it? Th- there were a lot of arguments for making it really low and not having Steam be the gatekeeper towards what can or cannot, you know, make it onto the platform. Right. And then a lot of arguments for the opposite direction, saying, you know, well, it should be five hundred dollars or eight hundred dollars, and it should be really more for, you know, serious developers um, to kind of weed out some of the the cruft, right? I I think there are good arguments you can make all along that spectrum. I don't know if there's really a, an easy right choice. Yeah, they said it was going to be either anywhere somewhere between a hundred and five thousand dollars. So, which is they, a pretty huge range. It is, and they they went for the lowest listed number in that range, which is interesting. Uh, there's also, and I, I don't think they've revealed exact details of this yet. I'm sure we will get them next week, but. There's some talk of you will be able to recoup that money. Yeah. So it's not like you just spend $100 and you are paying Valve $100 to get on the store. It's essentially just a bare minimum weed out the spam games, right? It's mm-hmm. you have to you have to put up the money to get in the door just so we don't have literally everyone posting junk like the way itch.io works where itch.io has some absolutely incredible games that you can only get on that service and and a really great platform. I love, love, love that site. But also, you know, there are dozen, a dozen games every day that are posted there that are like, you know, just somebody making a little experiment and it's like a bad Flash game and that's it. And and <laughs> that's what Steam's $100 fee is just trying to avoid, you know? They're, they they want it to be super open. They don't want to have this curatorial process anymore, but they also don't want that <laughs> Um, so it'll be well, interesting to see how it works. You know, the funny thing is, like, this idea that $100 is somehow a lot of money for Valve. Like, that's uh-huh. ludicrous. Like, how many games came out on Steam last year? 10,000, say? I mean, like, even if it's even if it's 100,000. It, it that's, wasn't nearly that many, but it was no, in the, it wasn't. It, in the thousands, saying, like, yeah. Like, 10,000 games at $100 a piece is just, like, a pittance to Valve. It's yeah, nothing. Yeah. No, they're def- they're definitely not doing it for the m- the money of making that money. No, and I I was one that I I kind of wish it were a little bit more because I'm like, look, if you spend months working on a decent game, which is what a a really decent game takes, like you don't create a good game in weeks or days, um, a really good game, at least in my opinion. So, um, I'm like, if you spent months on it, like, come on, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, that shouldn't be that big of a barrier to entry, and it does it does weed out the just garbage. But oh well, it is what it is, and we'll see see how many new games come out on Steam the next year. I mean, I I would not be surprised if we see an explosion of games come out on Steam in the next couple weeks, and then it kind of calms down a little bit but i would be willing to bet there are a lot of indie developers who have a hundred dollars and who never went through green light who are just gonna do it who are just gonna say yeah right. and get their thing on steam although at the same time as green light existed uh there were still plenty of games making it onto steam that were hardly from AAA publishers that did not go through green light mm-hmm. because it was still an option to have a connection at Valve and just get your game 
right, you right, know, right. approved and released. So, yeah, I, I don't expect it to make a big difference in the quantity of games, but I could easily be wrong. Um, but I also saw some interesting discussion around what I have definitely felt uh, over the past year or so, which is just there are too many games coming out on Steam to keep up with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I saw some some people um, kind of pushing back against the notion that there was there is a shovelware issue on Steam where if you follow the feed of games and kind of look at, you know, oh, that kind of looks like somebody's, you know, kind of junky little first project or whatever. Um, but then they were like, uh, someone was comparing those games to games that won like the independent game festival awards eight years ago. And at least just looking at the graphics, which is hardly, you know, a great way to judge the depth of a game, but it was like, oh, actually this looks like something that could have won an award eight years ago. Uh And it just kind of shows you how much, how quickly the independent games, you know, movement has changed and how much better they've gotten in such a short amount of time that projects that are just getting dumped on Steam that we can barely keep up with now would have made headlines eight years ago. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good point to call out. Uh, I do, we have a lot to talk about. I do want to jump along and actually do a little bit of a different Valve news story, uh, which is... It came out last night, I think, yesterday, that Jay Pinkerton just left Valve, um, who is a writer at Valve. He wrote a lot of, I believe, like the TF2 kind of comics and stuff. He, he he had a hand in a lot of things you know from Valve uh, on the writing side. Uh, but the reason I wanted to bring this up is because it's an interesting trend, right? This is now does, Chet— Does Valve have writers anymore right. is the question, yeah. Chet, who, who is it now? Chet Falizek, uh, Jay Pinkerton, and— Eric Walpaw. Eric Walpaw. Uh, I think there's one more I'm forgetting, who are all the writing the writing people, like the team behind, you know, Half-Life and Portal and all of Valve's games— are just not there anymore, yeah, and they've not, all I'm left. I'm not sure if they them. worked on Half Life. Um, probably not the first one. Maybe some on, uh, some of them may have worked on Half Life too. But oh, definitely, I thought, thought Half Life's writer left. I, you may be right about that as well. Half Life. Uh, I think you are. That might be the other the other person who left. But either way, the people who made their games funny, Mark um, Laidlaw. That's, that's who, who it was. was yeah. yeah. Uh, so he was a, a real veteran, right? And these guys had also been there for years and years. Um, But yeah, I mean, it it seems to suggest a trend of Valve not making games anymore, which Mm -hmm. is kind of how it's felt since Dota 2, basically. You know, Dota 2 has... They have Dota and they have Counter-Strike, and those are games that perpetually make money, and they do keep working on them, uh, and they keep making money, and it doesn't seem like there are any signs of them putting out a new, you know, single player or, you know, Left 4 Dead kind of multiplayer game anytime soon, at least not one with jokes in it, since the guys who wrote all the jokes are no longer there. Yeah, it's interesting. It's just going to be interesting to see, or I, I wish we knew if this was like some kind of this recent rash of this happening, like if something triggered it or if it really was just, you know... They realized they weren't making games anymore. I, I don't know, but it's just, it's just, you look at that all happening kind of within a short time span and you, you wonder, right? And it's not like they were getting fired or laid no, off. Yeah. You know, it was clearly them leaving. And if you look at the last um, time they had a game come out with their writing in it, you know, it was years ago. Yeah. And I'm sure Valve has been working on other games. You know, it's probably trying stuff out. Um, and, you know, either those projects are still in development or they kind of, you know, fizzled out. Who knows? Um, well, you guys, I mean, we're all we're all kind of creative types like we we write stuff for a living. Right. And can you imagine like if you were in charge of writing stories for video games and then for the last you know five years or whatever, all of your stories were just prototypes that never got released to the public like that would have to be really draining over time. You'd kind of get to yeah. the point where you're Absolutely. like, Absolutely. This is a really drudgery job. I'm sick of doing this stuff that never gets out to the public. And maybe it wasn't even a drudgery job. Maybe it was a wonderful cush job. But yeah. if you're, if you're, uh, you know, if we, the thing you find satisfying is writing that stuff and having it eventually 
come out and be in a form people can see and be meaningful that like you say it's still draining even if it's you know even if it's the best place in the world to work but you never get that satisfaction of publishing it you know that will get to you over time yeah yeah i mean like that's kind of why i write for pc gamer like if if you get right down to it like if you wrote for a tiny website and even if you made more money or not like if you're not re being read by tens of thousands of users and getting lots of comments you kind of go like oh i put all this time into an article and no one read it you, yeah would you write just for me jared uh no <laughs> <laughs> dang it screw you wes <laughs> uh jumping along to our next topic this is one that might be a little contentious uh battleborn is now free to play Asterisk. Asterisk. Yeah, here, I'll even add that to the topic there. Um, the the reason there's an asterisk there is because if you let Gearbox tell it, Battleborn now has an unlimited free trial, which will give you... Wait, wait, can you play it? You can play it. Okay. Yeah, and the, the free trial is not limited in any way. It's only the multiplayer, I guess, is the... Or it's the PvP, excuse me. Um, so none of the campaign stuff. But... And you only have, like, access to a small rotation of heroes, like a free-to-play game. <laughs> um, and you can unlock all the other stuff in the game, either with real money, like you can just buy the game outright like you usually would, or you can unlock it with in-game currency that you earn in-game, like a free-to-play game. And so, like, they're not calling it free-to-play, but also they – it is that. So if you'd like to play Battleborn, you can – you can play it now for free. Uh, maybe it'll get a get a bit of a fan base behind it. I mean, it'd maybe be, it'd be nice. I have, I bear no ill will towards towards that game. It just came out at the wrong time and got mm -hmm. just utterly buried, and then became kind of a kind of a joke, I guess, to just be it, like, well, it's yeah. not, you know, it's that game that failed, ha. Huh? Yeah, it definitely became a meme a, a bit. Um, but yeah, so that's a thing that happened. If anybody would like to fight me IRL about calling it free to play, that, okay, like let's do it, let's go. But um, I'm gonna box Randy Pitchford yeah. on the PC Gamer Show one well, month from today. So that's the thing, Randy Pitchford. He's a, the president CEO. I can't remember the name or the title of Gearbox. Yes. Okay. Head up, top of Gearbox uh, was on on Twitter, kind of, and I don't mean to start any sort of shit by <laughs> by discussing this, but like he was he was arguing with people about the distinction between free trial and free-to-play, which I will admit is 100% semantics, right? Like, it kind of doesn't matter. This is what they're doing with the game regardless. Like, whatever you want to call it is... It's like when Hitman was like, we're not episodic, and, like, then a few months later, they were like, okay, we're episodic. Um, you know, it... It just it just seems like it's all just like why argue about it? I guess know? it's trying to avoid a stigma, you know, a branding stigma. But yeah. I don't know. Does free to play have? I guess for some people it still has that stigma, but it, it feels very much to me like if the biggest games in the world use this model, you just need to make sure the way you're using it is not in the way that shitty games use it, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. There are plenty of free-to-play games where the model is totally fair, where you get access to a good amount of stuff, you can pay for more, and the things you're paying for are not directly related to your... Pay to win. Yeah, exactly, or not pay to win, right? Free-to-play, in my mind, is not the dirty word. Pay to win is the is the dirty word, so... All right, and the last the last news story I want to uh, touch on before we move on to what we've been playing recently is um, about it's a, it's a weird one, uh, but Jared, you'll definitely be able to help us with this one. It's about that, uh, a shortage of AMD cards. Um, oh, have, have you heard man. about this while you were in Taipei? Uh, I saw you talking about it, and I didn't know that there was particularly a shortage. But to to just jump in here, what Tom's going to talk about is uh, there's a new form of cryptocurrency. What's it called? It's called Ethereum. Tuan was quick to point out that it's not technically it's not new. new. It's been okay. around for a couple years, so it's newer than most, but newer not than, like brand than Dogecoin, new. perhaps. Yeah, if that still exists. Um, but a cryptocurrency, if you're not familiar, uh, is basically like Bitcoin, right? We're yeah. not going to go into all the details of that because I'm sure we would g get some of them wrong. Um, it's but, money backed by the power of math and computers, basically, instead of trusting the government. Right. Or trust right. mathematics. <laughs> uh that's a layman's br approach. brilliant idea. Nothing could ever go wrong. 
um, <laughs> with cryptocurrency. Uh, but the this one uh, in particular is better mined with AMD cards than with, I guess, other graphics cards. Um, mining being this weird process where you basically set your computer to work on an algorithm and by solving math problems generate this uh, this money. Um, and so people. I have could been... tell you the whole. Of, I could go into the whole detailed thing, but it takes like twenty minutes. The the idea is basically you're you're helping to secure a network of transactions, and in order to incentivize that, every certain amount of time, you saw you find a solution, and there's a reward for finding the solution. And that's Bitcoin's reward is every ten minutes you get a block solution on average. So sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's 30 minutes. Um, Ethereum's, I believe, is one minute, um, which is good because it helps transactions process faster. And uh, and ideas like it distributes the wealth to all those who are, per- who are participating. So guys who got in early on Ethereum and never sold it could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars now. Most of them need to pay power costs, so they sell it. Um, <laughs> Um, I don't know. But, but yeah, so people are buying up scads of these AMD cards to run them in mining arrays. Because apparently uh, the the newest series, the AMD 570 and 580, are like really, the RX, RX well, 570 and 580 are like the best for doing this right now? They're, they're kind of the best. Here's, here's the big thing is Ethereum was created by a Russian dude, and that guy talked with the Russian president recently, and the Russian president endorsed... Ethereum. He's like, this is great stuff. Is made by a Russian citizen or whatever. I don't know exactly what he said, but that this just spiked got interest. so much more sinister to me. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> so, so that spiked interest. Bitcoin's value over the past two months has gone from like a thousand dollars to almost three thousand dollars. Ethereum went from like forty dollars to two hundred and sixty dollars. Um, Ethereum was like maybe ten dollars. Uh, late last year. So, you know, if you had a thousand Ethereum coins from uh, from late 2016 that were worth, say, um, $10,000, you know, now they're worth $260,000. So, you know, there's there's that huge. And, and because the price went up, of course, all the people went, oh, my gosh, it went from making $2 a day for a graphics card to making $5 a day for a graphics card. So, yeah, you could buy a $200 RX 480, RX 580, and earn $5 a day by letting it run these algorithms. And when you do the math, you're like, and the power cost is maybe $0.50, cents maybe less depending on where you live. And so you're like, hey, 450 a day times 30 days, that's $150 a month almost. You know, I pay for the hardware in 2 months, say. Um, and and that's, you know, whatever the the actual amount is. And so people are like, oh, well gosh, I I can build mining farms. And so the big mining farms have literally thousands of GPUs. And AMD has traditionally been better. NVIDIA can definitely do cryptocurrency mining. Um, and, you know, you can make various arguments for one or the other. Uh, so, But the, the net result is people went more strongly for AMD because their cards had a lower price, which resulted in their cards running out of stock. Which uh, is it's just so weird that this, like, whole world that I, like, am just fascinated and confused by is, like, affecting graphics card prices. And, and I, this I, isn't the first time either. Yeah, I, I think so, uh, I remember a friend of mine years ago saying, oh, you have an AMD card, it's better for, for doing Bitcoin. Um, I think they've always been better, or for a long time anyway. For, for it wasn't it wasn't really until 900 series did okay 10 series has done a lot better on cryptocurrency for mm-hmm. Nvidia part of that's the algorithms but uh, the anyway the net result is like in 2011 there was a spike that caused AMD GPU shortages and price hikes 2013 when the R9 290s came out 290x's um, there was a huge spike in demand for AMD cards that drove the price up from like four hundred dollars to seven hundred dollars. And those cards you just couldn't buy. And, and it really hurts AMD on the gaming side because every one of those cards sold to a miner basically is not going to be used at all for gaming. And so their market share in Steam or in the gaming community just gets pummeled even mm. while they're selling every card they make. So it's funny that their their sales actually do much better than – can do much better than the perception of, yeah. of yeah. Their, their market share. Huh? That's funny. Jared, I, I'm gonna move to have our our benchmarking guides include cryptocurrency mining speeds in them. So it's well, like 
the funny thing is, is like if you want to maximize your mining performance, there's all sorts of stuff like you should use this old driver from like a year and a half ago on AMD. I don't I don't know the exact driver. Right. Or anything That's like so that. weird. But it, it's all sorts of stuff like that. So your drivers matter. Your OS matters. Wow. They're running Linux or, or Windows 7 or, you know, it's all these weird things where they're like, hey, you can get 10 percent better performance by running a year old driver with some modifications and flash your BIOS and undervolt it and <laughs> clock the RAM higher, clock the GPU lower. I mean, it, it gets really complex. And I sit there and I said this in the article that we put up about on it. I've done cryptocurrency mining. Um, I'll just say this, like there's a reason NVIDIA's Tesla cards are clocked lower than their GeForce cards. They are meant to run heavy workloads 24 seven day in and day out. And they've got these big server style fans that can just be pulled out and replaced. Um, and so if you're going to do cryptocurrency mining on consumer hardware, you're very likely to eventually burn out your fans and the cards aren't made to replace fans really easily. So just, just be aware of it. Um, I would say be more conservative in your clocks. Like uh, under clocking, under volting is good. Overclocking and going for every last bit of performance, you're likely to burn out your fans or GPU or VRM faster. So, uh, if anyone if anyone gets rich from listening to this episode of the podcast and deciding to go into cryptocurrency mining, please send us an email. Like, just please, <laughs> I want to know. And you owe Jared a commission for inspiring. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. No, no, no. I'll tell you the simple math. If you put ten thousand dollars into building like four high-end rigs with like four gpus each um you could probably have it all pay for itself in less than six months wow. and everything after that is profit but but the price kind of trends down over the time for hardware right 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 so so what makes five dollars today might make four dollars per day in a couple of months um it's hard to predict where it will go it's very volatile market, but the the math is pretty much you're almost guaranteed to break even within six months on the hardware, and even and, after power costs. But also keep in mind that unlike real money, which in the states is backed by the FDIC, you know if your bank goes kaput, your your money is still protected by the federal government, barring an entire government catastrophe, uh, which is always possible. Um, but barring that, right? But with a cryptocurrency, you know, you can have a situation like Mt. Gox where this network, uh, this bank basically went down and everyone who had money in it just lost just, everything. Just gone. Yep. Just all that money wow. is just, it's and, just and like, it, it's just like a web page. Just somebody hit delete on a server somewhere and kaput, you know, there goes all, the, there goes the all guys, your money. The guys who ran Mt. Gox basically stole the bitcoins is what the word is right anyway I, i'm so, not even sure <laughs> stole stolen or lost uh the end result is the same for four hundred thousand for yeah. poor guys yeah anyway let's anyway. let's let's jump along uh let's talk about some games we've been playing also i want to give a shout out to luke a skywalker for subscribing thank you very very much for that uh but let's Let's go to, to our now playing section. I actually want to start off this week um, because I've been playing a smattering of things. Uh, I've been hitting Gwent pretty regularly still. Talk to us about Gwent. Uh, I, so I've talked a little bit about it recently on the show. Um, but I wasn't here. Yes, you weren't here. The thing I would say about Gwent briefly, which I, which I talked to you about a little bit earlier, when it hit open beta, like they really changed the game in a lot of cool ways that I wasn't expecting like they they basically completely redid an entire faction of the game they northern realms right yeah, yeah they added a bunch of challenges they reworked a bunch of cards they reworked like all the weather effects it was just kind of surprising to see how much they like really refreshed the game on open beta launch which was not expected um but i've been enjoying that uh, another game I, I finally got to play for the first time ever after Many, many, many people ta telling me about it is a uh, Mini Metro, mm, which yeah. is an old kind of. God, I, I really like Mini Metro. I, I've only played it a little, little bit. Popular on mobile as well, right? Yeah, it's it is. It's on Steam and it's on I iOS. They actually just announced recently, and and this was one of the things that that drove me toward it. Um, they announced recently that uh, they hit a million players fi finally, pretty um, good across all platforms, but. It's, it's this really cute little game where you're basically, you're building train lines or underground lines, but the whole game looks like you're looking at a subway map. Um, the visuals of it, uh, 
I spent a lot of time doing that in the past week. Yeah, <laughs> in, like in, in Taiwan. Supplements. Yeah. I wonder if I wonder if Taipei is a is an, a map in this game because they have it has kinda, a great subway. They have bases of like you know levels built around specific cities or the way they look. Um, it's it's a really cute game, and I just I'm I'm glad I finally got a chance to play it. I it had been so like so many. It took so many people telling me it was a good game to actually finally play it. Why and, didn't you believe them, Dom? I mean, it wasn't that I didn't believe them. It was just I don't know. I just hadn't played it. And what do you have against playing games? I, everything, lots of things. Um, so yeah, I was I was pleased with Mini Metro. Um, pretty pretty pleased indeed. Uh, another game I wanted to call out real quick because I got I got like a handful that I've just been jumping between that I'm really really excited about. Um, I got to play the demo of Avon Colony last night. Um, Avon Colony. It's kind of a SimCity esque builder on a fictional alien world called Avon. There we go. It's, I was gonna say the moon. And I was like, that's not right. No, it's like Avon Prime. It's like a very it's it's very lush, which I like about it. It's not like just a. It's it's kind of like the Civ Beyond Earth worlds where they're like very vibrant and bright and lush and. Um, I was like less enthused with it than I thought I was going to be. We were giving away demo keys. I think they might be gone now, but we were giving away demo keys on the site uh, for it. If you, by the way, were a member of the PC Gamer Club, you got a demo key before everyone else, and so you should sign up for the club because we do that for all our giveaways. God, you're so cool. Shameless in the plug. Club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, That's but, slick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No. Um, but uh, I was. I. I kind of know. I don't know. I, it didn't have as much creativity or as like I, I guess I what I said let me rephrase this because I'm stammering now what I said last night about it was I didn't buy into the fantasy of it as much as I did in a game like City Skylines or Sim City because in those games you can you can build your city and you see it grow and you see your people and you see the cars moving and stuff like that but when I was building on this alien world, it all felt very utilitarian to me. It felt very much like you need more power, so place a power generator. So you not need... enough personality yeah. in the types of buildings, the way citizens move around. That exactly. Kind of stuff. It's like you need more housing. Okay, I'll I'll put another house. Okay, I need more food. I'll place another farm. You know, it was like very much just like as I saw a bar get lower, I just placed a thing to raise that bar back up. Mm. And and it was fun. It was a good city builder, but it was like, I don't think I'd want to do that for very long. I didn't feel like I could really express myself very much um, w within its building. May that was just the demo, though. So, you know, that, that game comes out next month. We'll have to see. Um, and then the last thing I actually played recently that I wanted to bring up was Awesome Knots. Um, Jody I've played that. The, yeah, the MOBA, two D MOBA, right? Basically, yeah. As Jody put it, Jody McGregor wrote an article for us yesterday. Said it was like Awesome Knots is the MOBA for people who don't like MOBAs, which is a good way of putting it because it's basically like a kind of this is a weird reference, but Earthworm Jim style side scrolling shooter game, action shooter, um, but it happens to also be a MOBA in that. So it's three v three, and you've got lanes and minions and towers and a core to destroy and buying items and all that jazz. But, um, yeah, I played it for yeah. about a week, probably a year ago or something. One of my friends was getting into it. It's it's okay. Yeah, I... It didn't really hold my interest, um, but I liked it well enough. I played it a fair amount back in 2012 on PS3. God, it's been around that long. Yeah, it came out in 2012 and from PS3, and then it came to PC kind of shortly after that, and I got really sad at the time um, because... And I had a gaming PC at this point, but I had I invested a lot in my character, my my account on on. Uh, mm, you on didn't PS3. want to start over. I didn't want to start over, and they basically the developer came out and was basically like, "Hey, it's way easier to update PC games, so we're going to give all of the updates to the PC first, and like probably it's going to take a long time to update the PS3 version." Yep. And that was just kind of the fact of the life fact of life. But I I got a little sad about that. But now it just went free to play. Speaking of free to play, uh, it went free to play a few weeks ago, and. Jody wrote this very good article about it, and I jumped back into that, and I'm excited to kind of try that a little bit more because I never really stopped playing it because it was a bad game. I just kind of drifted away from it. Um, and it, there doesn't seem to be any sort of pay-to-win or anything like Quite that. Quite short matches, as I recall. So yeah, they're like 15, 20 minutes, If you found, um, you know, games like League of Legends or Dota uh, overwhelming just for the, the length of a game, you know, lasting 45 minutes to an hour... This is a, a much more approachable 
match match length than those games have. Yeah, for sure. But that's that's what I got. That was kind of a shotgun blast of things because I was just really, I don't know, I've been having fun playing a lot of different stuff lately. I played some Gwent uh, as well on my on my trip in Taiwan. Not a whole lot. I mostly did the challenges, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. like little single player. They're kind of just there to tutorialize you, help you learn the game. Uh, and some the challenges all give you some rewards, so it's a good early way to get some kegs, which is the the card packs uh, of Gwent, and also you'll get some leader cards by beating certain. If you beat the Northern Realms faction, you get like a second leader card for the faction that lets you gives you a different ability, basically. Yeah. Um, so I did. I probably did like half the challenges or something. Played a couple online matches. It is a totally different game than the Gwent of The Witcher 3. Oh, yeah. And a, like, 75% different game than the Gwent of the closed beta. Yeah, when it's it, really been when changing. When it first launched, um, which I think was necessary for it to be a, a competitive game. Uh, I kind of miss some of the some of the old stuff um, from from old Gwent. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to keep playing it just because I think competitive card games aren't so much my thing. But I'm really excited for the single player campaigns that they're going to be launching probably relatively soon. Like, I, I'm thinking they're going to come in the fall. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, a story expansion for Gwent hit in September or October or something like that with, you know, a bunch of missions and and G- Geralt running around uh, on kind of the they showed a little bit of this in their trailer, which is the same stuff I saw at E3 last year running around on this kind of comic booky world map. Um, it's it's a cool, very. Uh, um, uh, what's the word? Cell shaded kind of art style. It's um, really like Borderlands. Ex- yeah, a little uh, bit. Uh, yeah, but uh, th- that kind of uh, black brush stroke uh, outlined to the characters, but without the more cartoon, cartoony, you know, elements of Borderlands, um, kind of sticks with the Witcher aesthetic pretty well. Uh, the art in Gwent is gorgeous, by the way, um, and I think that will probably continue in the campaign. I do not mind at all if they kind of stick with this two D. Uh, 2D style yes. instead of you know trying to do anything, anything you know in the Witcher three 3D engine or something like that. I think this is a, a good good way to tell a cool story, uh, partnered with a card game. For uh, those of you on the podcast, you can just look up the Gwent open beta gameplay trailer and kind of towards the end of it, literally that's all it was. They like show I, about ten seconds. Yeah, yeah, ten seconds might be generous. Like they they just show this little bit of a, a clip, and even just that little clip is like really unexpected from Gwent and makes me want to play it more. And so they've said that those uh, the single player stuff will cost money. You know, it won't be part of the free to play. My right. guess is they'll be like five or ten bucks or something uh, for a campaign. And I am totally down to, to pay that. Uh, and, Sounds and more like an unlimited free trial to me. <laughs> I've actually found in my the bit of time I spent with Gwent that I kind of liked the single player challenges more than playing against other people. Um, Because if you're playing against other people, you need to get invested in the meta game. You have to learn deck building, learn counters, all Mm -hmm. of this stuff uh, to anything that could be in the game. And I found with a couple of the challenges that I did, uh, the the first ones would be pretty easy. And then as you kind of worked your way through a deck's challenges, there would be some pretty difficult ones. And for those, I found myself on a couple of them trying... Almost winning, but losing, trying again, getting my ass kicked then a second time, trying again, you know, coming close and picking up on the pattern of what cards they had. And so without needing to learn some meta level strategy for dealing with all players who have Nilfgaard factions right. or like, OK, if I'm using this deck, what kind of decks is it going to be good against? I went, OK, I basically know what cards this AI has in his hands, in his hand, how can I work against that? Like, how can I play my cards that I'm dealt in the right order to counter what I know he's going to play against me, which is kind of what it was like to play Gwent in The Witcher 3 as a single player game. If you went up against a really hard opponent, you're like, okay, I know he has a bunch of spy cards and he's going to be 
holding, you know, such and such card back for this round. So the way I would end up beating those challenges is on the first round, I would play just enough cards to make them trigger some of their better cards and then, you know, give them that round. And then I would like one of the challenges I remember, he always had Geralt and that was like the last card he would play basically on the last round. So I knew I needed to have at least that much strength Mm-hmm. To, to counter against him because I knew he was going to have that Geralt card. Uh, so I found that satisfying and less stressful than playing against other people is where, of course, you have no idea what they're going to come at you with. So that was, that was fun. So I'm looking forward to more single-player stuff from Gwent. Anything else you wanted to call out or Jared? Any games you've been playing lately? My bucket of shame is huge. Like, my... <laughs> I can't even tell you the last game I actually beat. I played a fair amount of Battlegrounds when I was benchmarking it and testing it. You know, and it's like, hey, I, I ran my four benchmark passes, and I, I just can't quit the game, so I'd have to see how long I could last. <laughs> <laughs> that, Makes that benchmarking was... take a little longer. What was your highest rank? I got second. Nice. Oh, man. That's dude. pretty good. That's like, uh, yeah. I was hiding in the in a house, and the guy came in, and I fired my shotgun, and and uh, you know, almost won, but he did a headshot with an op or whatever. Uh, bummer. So. Oh man. Um, so on my my trip to Taiwan, I spent a, a decent amount of time in hotel rooms, uh, just relaxing. And for those of you who don't know, in the summer. Uh, Asia is, you know, near the equator is very hot and humid. Uh, and so I was hiding from the humidity as much as I could, uh, during the day and would go out a bit more at night when it was a little cooler. Uh, so during the day I did a lot of reading, uh, watched the first season of Twin Peaks for the first time, Mm. uh, somehow never, never caught Twin Peaks, I guess because when it was on, I was like two years old. Um, but but never watched it in the the interceding years, so I'm watching that for the first time. Uh, but I also played a bunch of this RPG that I've been playing, The Legend of Heroes: Trails in the Sky, which I right. talked about on the podcast probably two months ago, uh, and I'm almost at the end of it now, and still not super impressed. I think it's a fine RPG, j- uh, Japanese RPG. It's kind of charming. Um, has I-, I give it props for. Be really committing to the slow burn. It's never that it's boring, but it is a very deliberately paced game that is really interested in the minutia of process. Like you play these characters who are kind of, uh, your, your characters are, your job is basically to be a hero, but you just go around and like help people out with their daily lives and kill monsters and, you know, give somebody an escort somewhere and all this stuff. And uh, so it's kind of turning the typical JRPG side quest into a career in the game, which is kind of a cool idea. And it's a game where, like, every time you go to a new region, you go talk to the person and, like, they register your paperwork at this new place, which is, like, just a thing that they find important in this game, I guess, to sell the world that you do paperwork. You know, and you're, there's no game mechanic for doing it, but they just point it out in the story every time. You're like, oh, yeah, I got to go register at the desk now. I really wish you had just told me that there was, like, a paperwork mini game. With I mean, there should have been stuff. as much as they, <laughs> they bring it up every damn time you go to a new place. It's like four times you go through this paperwork thing. Um, so it's it's a game that cares about that stuff, and it cares about giving you a really slow... Uh, development for the characters and their relationships to each other, which is which is admirable, but it's still at the end of the day is kind of JRPG writing and JRPG storytelling and nothing uh, stand out there like you would find in a Persona game, for example, or some of the better Final Fantasy games. So it's an okay game. I've been enjoying it, um, but I still don't quite get the get the hype for for why it has such a cult following. I mean, I don't have. This is the weird thing. I don't have time for okay games anymore. Like, I'll, I'll play a game that I'll recognize as being, like, solid, you know? And I'm just like, yeah, this is a solid, fun game. I gotta go play other stuff. Like, <laughs> I, so you're, I can't settle. You're very responsible in that way. Someone was asking me, uh, w- while I was at Computex, uh, someone was asking me how I, like, what games I was playing. You know, he's like, what are the hot, the hot new games? And I thought about it for a second, and basically what I told him is I aggressively misuse my leisure time by just playing <laughs> p- 
playing games that I have no uh, responsible reason to be playing for keeping up with what's new in PC gaming. I played a bunch of Vanquish. Uh, so in a way that was new, but also as a seven-year-old, you know, or six-year-old shooter or whatever. Yeah. Um, but right now I'm playing a JRPG from 2004 that was, <laughs> re- you know, released in the West in 2012 or something like I, that. I so. wish I could. And, and last year I played a bunch of NetHack, which is a, you yeah, know, an, an ASCII from 1980s. O- originally from I think the 80s or early 90s um, that has been you know in development for in development air quotes for years and years and years so I remember yeah. playing NetHack when I was in high school and I'm 43 so it's it's old it's been around <laughs> yeah did, did you ever uh, did you ever clear clear the dungeon Would no you... but so the precursor to it like we call these games roguelikes right I I played the original Rogue on like a, a Tandy or something computer back in the mid '80s, and I and then later on various PC compatibles. But uh, I did actually beat Rogue once, where it's like you get down to level 15, level 16, and you find the amulet of Yendor, which is like yep. the the yen symbol from ASCII and and then you find it then you have to actually climb back out of the dungeon and so a couple of times I got the amulet and then got killed on level 15 trying to get back out um once you got back up to like level seven or so you were usually home free but uh so I I did beat Rogue once um that was and and the ending was basically like a text like congratulations you win I can't remember exactly what it was, but I it was feel pretty like, bad. I feel like anybody who has beaten Rogue at the time Rogue came out should like have a medal or a plaque or something. <laughs> I should get a Steam achievement. That's a real that's a real gamer, real gamer right there, Jared yeah. Walton. That is that is if like if PC gaming had like the military kind of like dress outfit, that would be a ribbon on there. <laughs> and and I mean NetHack I is basically. I did Call of Duty and Rogue. <laughs> it, it was Rogue and then Hack and then NetHack, and they're all kind of it, it, NetHack and Hack and NetHack are both just versions of Rogue, basically mm-hmm. that just add more stuff. But the the core game is you go uh, get the amulet of Yendor and try to try to escape. Man, that is was, that is a callback. Was, was it wasn't NetHack the one that one of there was some game I thought it was NetHack but I can't remember one of them added multiplayer was that NetHack so oh. NetHack um, there are servers you can play on where people can observe um, and it has a actually Dark Souls style um, kind of multiplayer element where if you're playing on one of these servers and you die uh, there's such there's a concept of a bones level where people will um, occasionally, uh, the dungeon that is generated for you will include the level that someone else died on. So the actual random configuration of that level with their remains on the level, as well as whatever it was that happened to kill them, uh, assuming it was an enemy. That's crazy. Uh, So you can find other people's bodies, and you'll find all their loot on them so you can get some awesome stuff from somebody's body that but is such a cool idea it's super cool uh and also you can get killed by the same thing that killed them if you, <laughs> you know, if you're unlucky you know um but it's, it is a really cool Dude, that is such a cool idea you know, it's, oh man it's great and there's we, we can we can move on um but there's a net hack story i want to pull up uh when i can find it that i don't think i talked about on the podcast before but this is one that my uh, one of my friends relayed to me when I was playing it a bunch last year, and I'll I'll find it and share it later in the podcast. Okay, okay. Let's uh let's move on though. Let's talk about I guess Wes, if you're looking for that, uh, we can talk about some hardware stuff, man. Uh, Jared, Sweet. Jared, there's so much going on right now as we as we discussed earlier. Like, wh- tell tell me. What what's all the new CPU news? Sum it up for me first, because there's like I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I know. No. So you know you know more than you can say at this point. But right. there's still stuff about like AMD's Threadripper stuff, which is the size of a Volvo in your computer case. There's um, <laughs> the i9 stuff, the i9 X or the X series of CPUs. We also heard were announced. Like there's a lot of just different big things. Some around Computex, some not. Just like give me give me the lowdown, man. What do, what do we know? 
know so far? So Intel has has basically disclosed most of their their LGA 2066 platform. It runs on on a X299 chipset, which of course AMD then one upped by being X399 with Threadripper. Um, little tip for tat there, but uh, <laughs> you know Skylake X, KB Lake X. It's the natural evolution of your Broadwell E and your Haswell E. The difference is. Intel actually has some real competition now on the CPU side. Like AMD's FX series was so far behind in terms of a lot of performance algorithms that that Intel didn't need to do a lot to stay ahead. And that's why you had a $1,700 10 core Broadwell E chip, the 6950X. So Skylake X will have a 10 core um, chip that's the 79, it's the i9 7900X. And the price is back down to $1,000. But because AMD's got Threadripper coming, and Threadripper will run up to 16 cores, 32 threads, and a single socket, a socket that's, like you said, it's it's huge. It's like this big. Um, it's almost twice the size of LGA 2066, I you, think. We have yeah. a photo of it on the site, right? It is it is yeah. really massive. Yeah, I'm, pulling, yeah, I, up, I'm I, pulling up a photo as well here for the, for the viewers. So anyway... Um, because of Threadripper having 16 cores, Intel is like, okay, we're going to release an 18-core Skylake X chip um, at some point, and they haven't really said when that will happen. But uh, they haven't told us clock speeds. They haven't told us anything other than it will have 18 cores, 36 threads, and it will cost $2,000, and it will still run in Skylake or in the X299 platform, and it will be fully overclockable and all that stuff. And we know it's called the i9 7980 X E, yes, that's a big name. Man, I hate um, hardware names. I've said it before. I'll say it a million times again. Yep. So, so everything twelve core and above on the core i nine stuff, we don't actually have clock speeds for just yet. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, the interesting thing is, unlike Ryzen, Intel's overclocking, you can clock, you can overclock based on number of active cores. So in theory, you could say, hey, if I've only got two or four cores active, run at five gigahertz. If I've got six cores active, run at 4.8. If I've got 10 cores active, run at 4.5. Um, and if 18 cores are active, run at 4.0. I don't know. Like those are not actual clock speeds, but like theoretically, those could be real possibilities. Whereas AMD, it's like Ryzen's pretty much topping out at 4.0, 4.1 gigahertz with some of the good chips on the right motherboard. And doing two Ryzen chips in a package, which is what Threadripper is, that's not going to actually increase your clock speed. So, you know, there's, there's going to be, I mean, people are going to hate me saying this, at least the AMD fans, but uh, Intel's still faster for gaming, period. Uh, it's, it's, they've got higher clock speed. They've got a little bit better IPC. So, uh, so anyway, Threadripper's coming, though. We don't know the price. There's guesses that the 16-core model might only cost $1,000 or less, which could very well be possible. And so that's exciting. Like, if you're doing video editing or some of the stuff that uses a lot of threads, Threadripper could be exactly what you want. It will rip your threads to pieces um, <laughs> with its 16-year-old created name. Uh, <laughs> Like you it's think, funny you think they went into like a high school focus group and were like, I don't know. "We need we need names for this new series of, <laughs> of processors." It's, uh, well, the, we were I was talking with some other hardware guys recently, and we're like, "Oh, you know, Epic, which is so Epic is their server platform. Naples was the code name. Um, Epic is four Ryzen CPUs, eight cores each, put on a package that is the Threadripper socket, um, but Epic is for data center." And it's spelled E P Y C, and uh, and we're just like you know, that's got to be the worst name for a data center product. Like, could you see a CEO of a Fortune 500 company? I don't know what it means, but we must have that epic processor. You know, uh, so uh, it's it's kind of weird. Like, I don't know. And Red Ripple take, feels more, a little bit the same. I take more issue with the fact that it has a Y in epic. Yes. Then the name Epic, Epic with a Y. You got to make it Googleable. Like, <laughs> you got to be able to find find it out there. So yes. that's good branding. Someone just it's an Colin, Epic processor. Colin R eighty just spelled it in chat and like looking at it as a word. It like does not even look like like it looks like it's missing letters, right? Like it looks like somebody has has made a typo in the name of this thing. It's a it's an acronym, maybe. Let's see. Everybody's powerful yellow CPU. 
<laughs> there we go. I, I, I like Threadripper personally. I, I prefer hardware names that um, – so for graphics cards, you always have the issue of – the numbers being meaningless and hard to compare against other numbers outside of that same series, right? So within a series, 1080, easy to tell that's better than the 1070, better than the 1060, better than the 1050, right? Uh, same on the AMD side. But then once you try comparing them across brands, it's impossible, right? Uh, and so I appreciate, same thing with monitors. Like I love that Acer uses the Predator series for their monitors instead of you needing to know, uh, like on the Asus side, it's like, oh yeah, it's the, they have like the ROG Republic, Republic of Gaming, like Swift series, but then you need to still know this like seven digit uh, model number there was a to brief, know which one you're trying to get, there, right? There was a brief and wonderful time where there was only one Swift monitor. Yeah. And it was like, great, yeah, the Swift exactly. is like the, a good monitor. I'm but now it's get like, oh, no, you want the PG-278Q, not right. the PG-231Q, <laughs> uh, you know? And oh, God. Not the MP24HQ. Oh, like, God yeah. forbid, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, so you, you say Threadripper makes it easy, but the problem is, like, what happens with Threadripper 2? And, it, I mean, it's the same thing on right, Intel yeah. Core i7, right? Like, everyone knows, like, the 5960X is better than the 5930K. But how yeah. does the 5930K compare to the 40, oh, 4920X or what? I can't even remember the models for the 400 series. So, you know, the first generation is easy. The second generation, it'll get more confusing. That's but, why sure. I've actually I, really... I just like Threadripper. It's fairly evocative, I think, as a, as a name. It's fun. It, it does. I mean, like... NVIDIA's got the Titan, the GTX Titan, and that's that's a pretty, like, you know, powerful name. So Threadripper, sure, go for it. But I know a lot of people I've encountered are like, that sounds like such a teenager name and whatever. <laughs> but, then, but then NVIDIA screwed up with the Titan naming because they were doing yes. okay. They did Titan, and then they did Titan Black, which is fine. I'm fine with all this. Then they did Titan X, which is also okay. And then they were like, okay, what's the new Titan? Titan it's X also. Titan X. And it's Titan like, X Prince C Pascal. Uh, uh, but no, it's like, but then they made the Titan X and then they made the Titan X again. And then they made, and everyone was doing it as Titan XP as like the shorthand because it had Pascal. And now aren't they like releasing a Titan XP or something? Yeah, the like, Titan XP is, is the slightly better than the Titan X Pascal. Oh, come on, <laughs> NVIDIA. I'm a fan of your graphics cards, but come on. There was also a Titan Z. Uh, back yep. in the day, oh, back right. in the, yeah, 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 the yeah. dual version, yeah. So it's tough. I think <laughs> I think you need to find that perfect that perfect word that you can augment with a prefix or a suffix that is understandably better or worse, right? So if instead of Threadripper we had blank ripper, mm. and then we could fit in things that were obviously. You know, like, oh, if you're if you're ripping like diamond, if it's the diamond <laughs> ripper, clearly that is that's the, a lot tougher than ripping threads. Threads yeah. are yeah. easy to Eas rip. Yeah. So easily, diamond ripper is the top end graphics card <laughs> or CPU or monitor or whatever the hell this product is, and then like then maybe you're gonna have the you know the steel ripper. Okay, that's still that's still pretty good. Steel's yeah. not easy to rip. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but so so anyway, back to the CPU yeah, stuff. Yeah, please, please. Um, so if, anyway, you've got Threadrippers coming. I, they've said summer, and we mm -hmm. know that there will be 16 core 32 thread. It will use a it, like the the socket is so huge that I've I've heard that the coolers will only work on socket TR4, which is also socket SP3, which is for Epic. Um, mm. But like it's either you buy a CPU cooler that's the size of your case and you put that on your CPU, or like if you have an LGA 2066 that uses the same size um, coolers as LGA 2011, and uh, and. I've been told by at least one source that the Threadripper coolers will not work with LGA 2066. At least theirs won't. So, um, so that that kind of makes it more niche. But uh, anyway, we'll we'll see what performance looks like. I suspect the the bang for the buck story is going to favor AMD. But if you're after raw performance, I just can't see AMD actually beating Intel. It's kind of it's the same thing as the Ryzen versus the existing Core i7 stuff. It's like yeah, AMD's definitely got 
a much more attractive pricing. You can get a $300 eight core 16 thread Ryzen 1700 and it it's competitive with the uh, i7 7900, uh, 6900K but not always faster and it doesn't overclock as well. And I think that will be the same story uh, with Threadripper versus Core i9 is that Intel will be faster, but it will cost more. Um, so so that's cool. Um, actually, and I got this, I want to show this because this yeah, is really cool. You, you were showing this off to me right before we started. And Anyone know what this is? You can say <laughs> in the comments. So uh, this, it, it might look a little bit like a, let's see. Describe motherboard. it for our, uh, our podcast listeners. Yeah, it's it's so it's this metal like plank that's about a quarter inch thick. And it's got all these funky cutouts in it and screws and stuff. It and looks like, like a, can... a food tray from the Star Trek cafeteria. <laughs> or it's, a bulkhead it's really from funky. a starship, yeah. Yeah. But what it actually is, it's the um it's called the open bench table. And so this is for benchmarking systems where you want to be able to easily swap graphics cards or CPUs and stuff. So um I, I can't say too much about where I got it. I don't think uh, you'll find out in, later this month, maybe. Um, but uh, it was set up with a computer, and I I got to bring it home. And I'm just like, this is really cool because it's it's like this erector set for computer nerds because <laughs> like all they've got all these screw things that store in various places, and it all comes apart. It ships in this cool flat box, and yet you can put together a complete system with liquid cooling graphics card and everything else in it um but it, it it's also kind of expensive it's 200 and, uh, it's 180 dollars i think but the cool thing is it was open source so you can actually get the uh get the the instructions for it and if you if you've got the right uh power equipment you could put a piece of plywood into a what's it called a uh i can't the the it's like a lathe, but not. But anyway, there's tools like a that laser will like, cutter. Or? Uh, yeah, but it's got some special name like CNC. Oh, a CNC machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CNC. CNC there you go. Yeah, so you can put a piece of board in, feed it the instructions, and it will cut the the actual plans out from a piece of wood or a piece of whatever you're using. So that's kind of cool. Um, so that's going to be probably my test bench for the next year. <laughs> Wow, man. So, uh, it looks pretty accessible yeah. compared to your average uh, case. Yeah. Yep. How, how many, how many, like, how many graphics cards do you go through in, in an average week? How many times are you doing a graphics card swap? Immediate follow-up question, how many of them are currently set up Bitcoin mining? <laughs> <laughs> 27. No, uh... <laughs> So if I'm testing, like when I do battlegrounds performance testing, for example, any of our performance analysis articles, I go, I will swap through 15 graphics cards. Wow. And usually over the course of a day or two. We I keep actually, trying to tell him to do fewer, but he just won't listen. The, the problem <laughs> is, so I, I did fewer the one time and we got all these people complaining. What about the 970? What about the 390? What about the 380? These were popular cards. I'm like, yeah, they are. So I'm like, all right, fine. I'm going to throw a 970 in, a 380, and a 390, and we'll at least have some some uh, numbers from the previous yeah, Wes, Think of the people. Keep in mind the think hours of, the of, of work d testing every one of those cards is for Jared. So, so talking about CPUs, um, I also want to throw this out there. If you guys have requests, I am reworking our CPU benchmarks. Um, new versions of some of the benchmarks I've used are available that now have um, better optimizations for the Ryzen architecture. Uh, I had people telling me, like, my gaming workloads were completely garbage because I was running on a clean system and I should have web browsers open and Discord running and all these things to try and make it more multi-threading friendly. Um, so I'm going to try and do another set of benchmarks running some web browsers and stuff to see if like core i5 becomes a, a real problem compared to ryzen 5 um, so any requests there specific things that you're like hey this this is something that everyone i i play games with uses let me know um but i try and keep it real um but i'm going to be ba basically re-benchmarking every one of my modern CPUs over the coming weeks in order to be prepped for the Core i9 and Threadripper stuff. And I'm going to be adding some more heavily threaded gaming scenarios to illustrate what happens if you've got other tasks running in the background while you're gaming. So Netflix and Discord and a Twitch stream while streaming and playing a game. <laughs> See, that's, that's where I'm like, that might be a heavy workload that I could consider, but... Uh, 
I, I'm like, man, if it's a good game, like you should not be like watching Twitch uh, at the same time. <laughs> I like, do that you a be lot, watching man. The game. Nah, yeah, I, 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 I guess I'll do it more with like mindless, answer. mindless games. I'll do it more. Like I think yeah. having a, as a general case of something a realistic practical workload i think having like a chrome session open with a few tabs and also having discord running is a pretty is pretty safe yeah. i would not be surprised if a not insignificant portion of the people currently watching this show were also, also playing, playing games game. uh, yes but but so statistics is this thing where you you basically can't can't um self-select for a sample you have to use random sampling or your statistics are crap and and the problem is all of the surveys of what gamers use for their hardware are basically self-selecting samples <laughs> uh, so it's like if you ask hey how many of you guys use multi-monitors well you're much more likely to get responses from people who use multi-monitors right and right so so you might get the statistic that says, hey, 25% of our respondents use multi-monitor. Well, you look at Steam survey, and it's like um, it's like 3% that use multi-monitor or something. It's, it's really low. And so you have to – you're trying to find this balance of like what kind of systems do people really run in the real world and what are they, what are they playing? I, I suspect the reality is the vast majority of gamers are on several years old hardware, and, you know, that's fine. Yeah, I when I was new stuff. <laughs> when I was talking to NZXT uh, at Computex, they said from what they've seen, average upgrade cycles about four years for hardware, which totally makes sense. I think that that's appropriate for most people. Maybe you change graphics cards more quickly than that, but yeah. not many people are going to do a whole new you know system motherboard CPU swap faster than that. I'm going to do. Well, a, you can, go ahead. You can make an argument to like buy the latest and greatest graphics card every year and sell your old one, mm. even if you don't do Bitcoin, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, if if you sell at the right time and you know get a good price for it, like you maybe you're only spending a hundred dollars getting a new graphics card. Like it's mm -hmm. it's conceivable. You yeah. Could, you could obviously sell a an older mid series card and then upgrade to a high end one and spend a lot more than a hundred dollars. But yeah. Wes. Yeah, like if you bought a 980 Ti for $650, around the time the 1080 Ti launched, you could still probably get $400 for it. Wow. Yeah. So not bad. Wes, but we're running out of time. I want to hear about Computex, man. I want to hear what was what, what was the cool things you saw, the coolest, the the most unexpected, the weirdest, any of that stuff. So the, the highlight of the show for me probably was doing um, a – this was kind of a, a bundle um, – two-parter so i i got to take a a workshop um with uh a professional overclocker who actually um founded or he sorry he wasn't a founding member uh but is a he runs hwbot the overclocking site mm -hmm. uh and he has been a member there for a long time um and runs it and so he was doing a liquid nitrogen like workshop at computex so i spent an hour with him uh the two of us doing liquid nitrogen overclocking together and asking him a bunch of questions about that process of doing that uh competitively and, and learning how to do it so that was really fun and i got to pour some liquid nitrogen on a cpu and we overclocked it to seven gigahertz uh so that was pretty that was pretty cool so was that skylake x that was Skylake X, I believe. Yeah, so Skylake X set a, a record for an Intel chip of like 7.57 gigahertz on liquid helium. We could we could get it to 6.9 stable, and then that particular chip, once it hits 7, was about the, the max it could get without us going, you know, we weren't going like crazy into... Um, doing super extensive bios tweaks and stuff like he kind of had a profile set up already with with a bunch of tweaks and we kind of worked from there and uh messed with a bunch of stuff um but so that was fun and That's then nuts. and then uh after doing that he um put me in uh in touch with this guy who was actually in the overclocking competition every year at G Skills booth there is an overclocking competition where a bunch of overclockers come and the grand prize is like 10 grand uh, and they're competing for three or four days trying to set the highest scores on you know various uh, various tests and one of the guys who was competing 
uh, is also the inventor of this tool called the uh, the Delid Die Mate that he made about a year and a half, almost two years ago. And it is a delitting tool for, if you don't know what delitting is, you're basically removing the, the heat spreader from your CPU, which is that silver top. It's basically when you look at your CPU, the top of it is the heat spreader. So you're taking that off, exposing the die. Uh, and the purpose of doing this is to put a different thermal compound on the die and potentially lower your CPU temperatures pretty dramatically. Uh, so not only did he show me this tool, talk to me about creating it, uh, he talked to me a lot about delitting and the reasons why you can get uh, make your CPU cooler by delitting and adding a different material, why uh, Intel has and has not soldered uh, the thermal compound on their CPUs at various times. A lot of people were upset that the new Skylake uh, X and... Um, KB Lake X CPUs are not going to have uh, solder, um, but for extreme overclockers, that's actually a good thing because it makes it easier to remove and put their own compound on. Uh, so that was a really fun conversation, and I wrote up the delitting uh, stuff on the site, which was really interesting to me, and I'm going to write up the overclocking uh, pretty soon when I get a chance. Um, but I think it's awesome that delitting has gone from, I guess a, there's Jared holding up a CPU with a, you can see the heat spreader on the top there. Um, but I think it's really awesome that delitting went from this thing that used to be just a terrible idea unless you were very skilled at cutting a CPU in half with a razor blade, basically. Because uh, there were no tools for doing it specifically, so you just had to uh, to wing it pretty much, uh, and that was a good way to you know throw away your two hundred fifty dollars or whatever uh, to being something that now, thanks to this tool that he invented, and then several other uh, people have done similar um, similar tools, uh, is really safe. Uh, at least the delitting process itself. There's still plenty of ways you can damage it, right? But the tool itself is not going to break your CPU the way putting it in a vise and taking a razor to it most likely would have. So so did you get to delit a CPU, Wes? So he, they already, all the ones they had on hand were already delitted. Um, so we put one in the tool and showed, like, we looked at how it worked, um, but didn't actually get to delid one. But I now have the tool, and I have a CPU at home that I uh, is a KB Lake i7, uh, and those things run pretty hot. So I think we will, I think I will do that uh, myself. I actually just ordered um, some new thermal compound this morning. Did you get the liquid metal? I got some liquid metal hardcore stuff, yeah. Uh, That's awesome. I was talking to to Channel, one of our um, Discord members uh, and moderators, and he is a big enthusiast. And he, he actually delitted back with, before the tools existed uh, and managed to not destroy his CPU. So props to him. Um, but he was telling me about the thermal compound that he used, and it's the same, similar stuff to what a friend of mine just used uh, on a i7-7700. So I'm looking forward to doing that and bringing my temperatures down some and then probably overclocking and bringing them back up. But, you know. Yeah, Channel is hardcore with his with his stuff. He is, for sure. He, like, uh, oh, God, I can't remember the, the name of it or the name of the technique. He, he wrapped all his own cables for his all his motherboard cables and stuff. Oh, and he like, did his own sleeving? sleeving? Sleeving, that's yeah. the word I was thinking of, sleeving, yeah. And he, he showed me also uh, a picture of the the keyboard he just finished where it's, like, this... Custom keycaps. Yeah, cu all custom, uh, no text or, like, colors on any of the... Or, uh, or uh, lights on any of the keys, so mm -hmm. it's all there, but, like, different colors. And he sleeved the cable for that, too. Like, it, it matches... So the cable going out of his keyboard matches the the sleeving on the cables of his like power PSU cables in his computer. Like it's awesome. It's a great, that great is a tool. hardcore enthusiast. Like I've never done personal <laughs> sleeving or, yeah. or delitting. Cause I'm just like, you know, there's a limit to how much time I have. I'm like sleeving is very tedious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I also really enjoyed talking to Noctua about their new fans that are coming. Uh, they're making some 
it just looks like a normal fan, but it will be better than their existing fans. And if you know Noctua, um, they're kind of renowned for making some of the quietest um, PC fans. Are you a fan of their fans? I am. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I'm so funny. The I got to play around (laughs) a little bit with the new um, laptops that Nvidia was was pushing under the um, what do they call it? Max Q. Is that it? Yep, um, Max Q. Uh, kind of branding uh, that are very thin and light. You know, it's basically like an ultrabook kind of form factor for gaming laptops with GTX 1080s in them. Uh, and there are some interesting quirks to these laptops. Um, the Asus one has this design where... So Asus and Acer both put out um, a model. They're very thin, But the keyboard is pushed all the way to the front of the laptop, and the space behind it is mostly for cooling. Uh, And you can tell they just needed every possible square inch of cooling space that they could devote uh, in these designs. So where's the touchpad? uh, So in the Asus one, it's on the right. uh, So it's kind of... In place of the 10 key. In place of where the 10 key would be, but only like half height for that. Um, so it's kind of crammed into that front right corner. Um, but you can actually switch it to a 10 key like digital layout, which is yeah. kind of cool. Um, but still a very cramped um, touchpad space. And then for the Acer laptop, there's a the whole kind of back part behind the keyboard uh, is this kind of glossy cover. And part of that glossy zone is a touchpad zone. So it's above the keyboard, um, which is strange. Uh, and and Aorus made made one as well, Gigabyte Aorus, uh, that is more of a traditional laptop design, not quite as funky as the other ones. So that one looked the most usable to me. Um, it's not quite as like sexy, crazy, thin and light as the other ones. It's less of like a concept laptop, I think. But I think it will end up for that reason being the most usable of the three of them. That's cool, man. I, I also want to pull up this this gallery that you showed, uh, or, or that you pulled up of um, yeah, some cases, case mods. Case, case mods are always the most exciting thing about uh, Computex, or maybe not the most exciting, but the most reliably cool. There's always like 50 just sweet case mods. This uh, is this is this one is my favorite that Tom pulled up. This is a case. Of a computer that looks like a Donkey Kong arcade machine. Yeah. To the point even where the water cooling pipes, the water cooling liquid is red, and the water cooling pipes are bent to look like the girders in Donkey Kong, and even have little barrels roll like fake rolling <laughs> down them. It is a incredibly beautiful case. That's um, insane. It, mainly due to the cooling, but also the just the paint job for the case is this classic bright blue. They recreated, or it's probably an, an original marquee up at the top of the case. Mm-hmm. They use like the vinyl decals. So basically all it's lacking is the CRT monitor. Yeah. Um, but it's just a gorgeous case mod. That's probably my favorite case mod I've ever seen. Yeah, that one was at, uh, we were talking about, it was at PAX East a while back, but, like, unfinished. And, God, there's also just crazy stuff like this thing, which is looks like something out of Vanquish. It's like a giant gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a sci-fi gun. Like, there's, it's it's crazy. We, you know, we were just talking about, like, yeah, man, uh, sleeving is too hardcore for me. And now there are these cases that are just, like, these insane insane beautiful things there was a great uh, master chief one that i think should be in this gallery but i also wrote it up as a separate thing um where there was just a computer inside master chief's like chest cavity <laughs> yeah there's there's some really cool stuff i mean oh, like so so this one, what is this, this yeah. tom's on uh this is not so much a custom build but it is a um it's a a case oh, or a rack, yeah, that someone made for Bitcoin mining. Oh, wow. Uh, so this is actually a rack that can hold like a dozen GPUs or something like that. Didn't Biostar say something like they had a, a, a motherboard with 13 PCI Express slots for Bitcoin mining? Yes, they were advertising that at their at their booth. I forget if it was 13, but it was a bunch, yeah. This computer has stuffed animals in it, Wes. 
It does. In the computer. That's a, that's a diva case. Is that the diva one? It is Maybe, the diva yeah. one. Uh, real quickly, while we're looking at these, uh, I do want to say, let's uh, let's open it up to a Twitch chat Q&A from you guys, So, because uh, we do want to take your questions before we run out of time. Um, so if you have any questions for us, chat, uh, tag us with at PC Gamer in the Twitch chat. Uh, we will grab your questions, and you can ask us about anything that's going on in PC gaming this week, or E3, or cases from Computex, or, or anything like that. We'd, we'd love to hear what you have to say. But uh, let's glance at a couple more of these cases while we're waiting for questions. Yeah, if, if anybody has Computex questions, by all means, there's a lot of stuff that I saw that I either didn't have time to write about or did write about um, but haven't talked about here on the show. So here's here's my questions with stuff. This is also a question that I have with, like, those shows like Ace of Cakes where they build, like, the, the cakes that look like motorcycles and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is a computer that looks like an aircraft carrier battleship. Yes, it is, Tom. But really the computer part is just kind of, like, on the side, and then there is a model of an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. And, like, at what point is a case mod just like a model someone built that happens to have a computer on it. Uh, Ed, I don't know. Does it, <laughs> does it matter? <laughs> I guess that's a better question. And no, it does not. I think, I think that one maybe is not a case mod because it was probably never a PC case to begin with. <laughs> right. Whereas this one we're looking at, this one is Diablo themed, I think, um, is clearly a case mod because it is a pc case that's a thermal take case i believe mm. uh with stuff grafted onto it um but it, sometimes it's hard to tell like the master chief uh one that i mentioned um i watched a video like a time lapse video of the guy building it and you would never know just by looking at it because it looks like a kind of you know dummy of master chief someone made but it started with a case, and then he built, wow. like, kind of mesh around it to make the form for the shoulders and then put the helmet on it and all that stuff. So it was actually a case mod uh, well, just if you guys, with a whole lot of stuff added to it. If you guys want to see the cases that Wes collected yourself, you can go to pcgamer.com slash computex-2017, and that's all his coverage from that week, uh, but also... The, that case mod piece is in there. You should be able to find it pretty easily. Just look for the giant robot gun that might be a computer, and, <laughs> and you will see it. Uh, but let's take some questions. Starting off with X Macho X Man X asks, uh, how do you guys feel about Twitch streaming more than just games, like all this IRL and streaming cooking shows, et cetera, and small concerts? Uh, I feel like it will eventually be less about games and more about people just doing whatever. Hope it doesn't go down the same road like MTV. What do you guys think? <laughs> I mean, that's um, how Twitch started. See, and then he says, my name is Just Macho Man. No need to say the X's. You got to put that at the top. Otherwise, I'll I'll be a dummy and read it. Anyway. Uh, you no, know, Twitch TV came out of Justin TV, which was right. uh, just a dude broadcasting whatever dumb shit he was doing at the yeah. time. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I, I don't know how I feel. I, I think that, that stuff's fine. I don't think it'll ever be like MTV just because, like, the content is created by like the people, right? Like they're, they're, you're not going to have some executive going, here's what we need, more reality shows, right? Like Twitch might push their agenda by like promoting that stuff, but I think if people don't want to watch it, that's not going to do as well. Um, I, I'm i fine with it. I think it's interesting to see Twitch branch out. I want to bake pies while streaming that. Like that's something I would like to do. Um, I've never watched the Twitch stream that was as interesting and weird as the night I spent with some friends uh, watching random streams on the, the Sony uh, Playroom TV thing. Do you remember you remember that? When the PS4 launched, they had this thing called the Playroom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and people were just, just streaming themselves, just doing weird stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely saw, like, some parents do coke with, like, their toddler in the room, saw this girl just, like, dancing and just talking to herself. Just weird, weird stuff uh, that I will never forget watching just in one night of, like, hey, I wonder what's going on in this playroom thing. Turns out, all kinds of stuff. Kind of weirdos so, want to broadcast themselves on the Internet. So I have no... Uh, no objections to people doing things on stream <laughs> that are other than playing games. Bring it on. Yeah, I might not watch any of them, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, they'll do their thing. 
Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, Kunifu says, after visiting a stave church in Norway yesterday that made me feel like I was in the vanishing of Ethan Carter, it made me wonder, if you could visit a location from a game in real life, where would you visit? That's a good question. Uh, I'm going to go with, I can't remember the name of it now, the, the city from Mirror's Edge. Because that city is really pretty. I guess I would have to say the city from Mirror's Edge if I am of a social class where I am not being oppressed. Um, but that's a very privileged thing to say. So, you know. Yeah, I, I think that city, I would love to see what that city would look like in real life with all its bright colors and and white uh, white exteriors and shininess. I think that would be really, really cool to see in person. I've had fantasies about living in a post-apocalyptic world since I was, like, 10 years old, 12 years old, and played Wasteland. So uh, I, would, I would love to go to, like, the Fallout world. I, I'd probably end up killed by radars or, raiders or uh, or whatever, but uh, but I, I that'd be cool. Run around the post-apocalypse with big guns and stuff, yeah. Let's say uh, Trino from Final Fantasy IX. If, if it's a city, mm. it was a city, right? Or a place. Place, location. Yeah. Not, yeah. So maybe not the whole world, but that's that city. Trino, for sure. That's a good call. That's a good shout, man. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Subscriber Turdog asks, who's doing the PC Gamer review for Dirt 4 at your office? I believe, and uh, I'm pretty sure about this, that Sam Roberts over in the UK is going to be reviewing that. Um, I know Phil Savage, another one of our UK friends, um, mentioned in the Discord channel that it is not exactly as exciting as he thought it was it's it's he's not as i think he believe he said he's not enjoying it as much as he, some of the other dirt games um primarily because i be, and i'm sorry if i'm misrepresenting his views here but he was saying it's kind of like the controls are like a little bit of a weird spot between sim and arcade that doesn't quite feel right and like you can choose an arcadey mode that just doesn't feel good and i don't know so he, he's not like crazy enjoying it as far as i can tell but that doesn't mean it's bad um that's just some impressions that i remember him jotting down but yeah i believe sam roberts will be doing that also turdog you asked what my my glass was this is just a hearthstone thing it's got nose dormu on it um because i'm a card game nerd like you guys didn't know uh Varen deal asks What's the, uh, from the perspective of journalists, uh-oh, is there anything in particular that game devs slash publishers do that really annoy you? Uh, not letting us review games until the day before? Is that something? Is that maybe that, not something we can really sucks. complain about? It's just annoying. Yeah, I mean, the more time you can spend with something, you know, in advance, the better. I'll, I'll jump off of that and just also say demos. I wish more demo games had demos live, you know, and that's not even just for, like, maybe that's not for, like, a journalist side of the, but just as, like, a person who plays games, like, I'd really appreciate having a demo, and, and when Chris, criticizing games, it'd be easier to tell people, you know, this is what I thought of this game. You can go try it, and you can figure out it if was, you agree. It was great for players when the you know the Xbox 360 generation of every single game having a demo version that you could play. I think that was a a really great thing for the players. Maybe it was not as great for developers um, or publishers who had to spend time on that stuff and also you know. Um, be afraid of of missing sales or something but mm -hmm. man it was great as someone who just wanted to know if they should buy a game or not yeah oh and tyler tyler jumped in the chat to say it's actually andy kelly reviewing it not sam roberts uh dirt four that is uh let's take a, a couple more questions if we have time i know there was one that got dropped off earlier uh by subscriber Ede spiny says um any opinions on the spatial sound enhancements in windows 10 uh, with Windows and Dolby Atmos stuff. Uh, I don't know about any specific Windows 10 spatial sound enhancements. Is that a, is that a recent thing? No, or? no opinion for me on okay, that. I, what, you should ask Tuan. I yeah, bet Tuan might know something. He's our audio guy. Tuan's definitely our audiophile. Uh, what I will say is Dolby, I like, I've used Dolby Atmos's stuff in Overwatch um, and really like it. it, it it's the stuff that does really, really good kind of 3D sound and you can really when you have that activated you can really really tell like where a voice line is coming from or where fire is coming from or footsteps yeah atmos is awesome but as far as i know 
very, very few things support it. You know, you need mm-hmm. both the hardware and the software to yeah. support it. And I think that's rare. So, yeah. Uh, we're going to take a minute. Uh, thank you. I, there's so many questions this week. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, but I wanted to take a, a moment just again to talk about E3. Uh, I'm excited about E3, man. It's going to be a crazy busy week. It's going to be a good show. Uh, once again, the PC Gamer Show, this podcast, will not be next week on Wednesday. We're going to take the week off to cover all the crazy news that's going to be coming out of L.A. Uh, but the PC Gaming Show will be w- on Monday, June 12th. 10 a.m. right here, twitch.tv slash pcgamer, or on youtube.com slash pcgamer, uh, or on hey, mixer.com slash pcgamer. Whoa. We're everywhere. Yeah, we're also going to be on Facebook, and and it's just going to be great. Uh, you should really, really watch it. It's going to be a very, very good show. Um, and, and beyond that, we're just going to be covering the hell out of E3. Like, that's just, that's the game plan next week, right? Is I'm, like, I'm excited to be doing it from bed this year. Yeah, I will, I will be helping out remotely with the E3 coverage from from bed as much as possible. Neither neither Wes or I will be going, or Jared. We're we're. Gonna... I will be testing hardware twenty four seven for the next two weeks. You're gonna you're not gonna like uh, you're not gonna benchmark based on all of the announcements. No, Jared's probably <laughs> tested something while we've been sitting here. We just haven't just haven't. No, noticed. I I didn't. <laughs> That's what we should do oh. next time we have you on. Is it's you all, should benchmark. It's all happening in his head. Up here, he's running running some numbers of some kind. Yeah, we should do like a benchmark race, and then at the end, you can tell us like who won. <laughs> um, but yeah, E3 is going to be a hoot. You should all be there. Uh, until then, we will. This podcast will see you in two weeks. We'll be back the following Wednesday for our normal show to break down everything we saw at the show. Um, But until then, thank you very, very much for watching this week, and we will see you next time.